Now, if you'd have kept it honest with you, you think you'd have been able to be one of those women who can let their man have another woman? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, not not this particular person. Anybody but her. Mm. <laughs> Any, somebody, anybody somebody but somebody her. y'all know, like a friend. Or? Um, it's just it was she, she was a it was a problem. One of the problems. So at the end of the day, I don't think I would have been able to share. You know. I don't think I would have been able to share, but I, I probably would have tried. Really? I definitely would have tried because, I mean, when you love someone, you would do anything for them. Mm. Anything. I would have done anything for She was ta- she was speaking from the heart. Yes, Mary J. Blige. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What do you think? What, what, what do you think of um, uh, Ramadan Mubarak? Ramadan Mubarak TV too. Yeah. Lots of um, Sh- Sheikh Shadid Muhammad, and you've been with us before. I'm happy that you're back again. Alhamdulillah, glad to be back, man. How's life been? How's everything been? Test I mean, of life. How's it? How's it, it going? It, I mean, it's exactly the way that Allah wanted it to be. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what? What can you do? You know? Yeah, relationships are a very important part of the deen, right? Half of your deen, half of your religion. Yeah, absolutely. and a lot of them are breaking up. <laughs> a lot of them, you know, people. What do you think of what she was saying? She was willing to do anything, right, for her man. Right. Yeah, she said that she would even have considered allowing her husband to have another woman, just to keep. You know, or just to maintain what they had. And that's that's the power of love. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that I talked about in my book, you know, the revolution of love. Mm-hmm. That love cannot be compartmentalized. You can't say that this is the, you know, we, we try to say that this is the way love is supposed to operate. You know, and love doesn't function according to anybody's frequency. It mm-hmm. functions on its own frequency. You know, and <clears throat> it's an emotion, just like any other emotion. And emotions are not supposed to make sense. I mm-hmm. think it was Shakespeare who said, you know, you know, vain is the person who believes that emotions are supposed to make sense. They, they're not supposed to make sense. They're emotions, raw, pure emotions, unfiltered. Mm-hmm. And that came out in her comment when she said, I would be willing to allow my husband to be with another woman just to keep what I have because when you invest in something to see the thing about love is uh, you know I was having a discussion you know last week with a, a group of young kids um, one of the questions that I asked is 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 a love a weakness is love a weakness and so most of the kids around the table said no it's it's what makes you strong and you know and I'm, and I'm thinking that maybe they didn't necessarily understand the context of the question but love is the greatest weakness. It's our kryptonite as human beings. Because love requires you to let your walls down and let a person see you for who exactly who you are. And that's scary. That's scary. And a lot of people would much rather keep the wall up, paint a facade, and then let you fall in love with the facade. Mm-hmm. So you never actually get to know who the person really is because they are afraid to let those walls down because it's it's the unknown. Is this person, once they see me for who I really am, are they really going to love me? Mm-hmm. Or are they going to just, you know, because there's nothing more shattering to the human spirit than for you to let your guard down, let a person see you for who you are, and then for them to, to decide, no, I don't, you know, I'm sorry, I don't want to love you, you know. How does a person pick themselves up after something like that? Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's scary. So it is love is the greatest weakness because it requires vulnerability mm-hmm. and people don't want to be vulnerable. So they much rather be surface. They much la- rather you fall in love with the fluff of who they are. And, and some people are okay with that. How do you, you know? distinguish between love and just lust? Someone thinks they're really in love, but really it's just an attraction. They just have this. How do you differentiate between the two, lust and love? Well, I think lust... Um, is is a result of not understanding love. Anybody who is in lust is because they don't understand love. 
because why would you it's almost like Allah says in the Quran why would you opt for something that is less than for something that is greater than you know love is greater than lust but the only reason that you would opt for lust is because you don't understand love you know so you know I you know, I think lust is an immaturity. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a person who just is in tune with the physical aspect of a relationship. She's cute. He's cute. The sex is great. You understand what I'm saying? Those are the physical aspects of relationships. Mm -hmm. Love is where you can come into this person's space and let your guard completely down and let them love you the way that they feel most comfortable loving you. Mm -hmm. And you're totally okay with that. And there's nothing greater than that. Oprah Winfrey said that during the time that she had her show, the Oprah Winfrey show, which ran from the mid 80s all the way up until the, the early 90s. And she said during the course of her show, she interviewed over 30,000 people. She said, and one thing that all of those people had in common, one thing that they all had in common was all of them were looking for validation. That's all anyone ever wants is to be valid, to know that they matter, to know that, you know, someone else sees their worth. That's all they want. And a person who is obviously in lust will never get that. Because lust is, there's barriers to lust that will not allow you to go any further than that. You don't go any further than the physical aspect of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's objectification because once you get the lust, once you get, you satisfy that lust, you're basically done with the person and then it's off to the next person. And this is what is happening in many communities, including the Islamic community, where relationships, where marriages have now become business deals. You know, you, you, you pay my rent, you take care of your, and then quid pro quo. You know, you do for me and then I'll do for you. And this is not love. Love, as she said, as Mary J. Blige said, that I would have been willing to allow my husband to have a relationship with another woman to keep my marriage. That's love. That's love because love doesn't function on a quid pro quo. If you give me love, then I'll give you love. You love regardless, in spite of the fact that the person doesn't love you. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the one who's in control of the heart, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is 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 love just a natural consequences of coming together? Or at least if you hold the boundaries set by the creator, eventually that love will come. But should there can there be a functioning marriage, even if every, every all... Every, everybody agrees to the turn or well, agrees to how it should be and they function peacefully mm -hmm. right and sometimes uh, one of the parties doesn't feel they're loved enough and you're t t around chasing this thing called love you don't love me you don't you know and then but uh, do men have a different way of expressing that they love you know what I mean let's say through financial means and whatnot so Absolutely. is love different between coming from a man from a woman Absolutely. Uh, there's a book that I, I have. I'm forgetting the name of the author. It's called The Five Love Languages. Mm -hmm. And she's basically talking about how people um, articulate love and everyone does it differently. Sometimes it can be by giving gifts. Some people sh express love through giving gifts. They like to give gifts um, service. People like to be in service to other people. You know, they like doing things for other people, running errands for other people, doing odd jobs from other people. And that is their way of expressing love. Some people like to spend their money. You know, they spend money and they buy things. And this is and this is usually the way that men, you know, especially alpha males. This is the way that we because alpha males are not in necessarily in tune with that emotional side. What's alpha male? A alpha male is that 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 lion in the pack the, mm -hmm. the leader of the pack a man's like, man a man's man mm -hmm. absolutely prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the epitome of an alpha male mm -hmm. but he was one he was a a, a a select from a select few of alpha men who was in touch with that emotional side mm -hmm. and obviously because him being raised as an orphan losing his mom at you know six years old his father dying before he was actually born and this was another thing that i talked about in the book that you know this helped to create that situation for him to be in touch with that emotional side you know you you take a, a mother away from a son at six years old you understand what i'm saying like yes. that is going to create a void in that boy's life and although he had other men his uncle abu talib his grandfather abdul muttalib he had other men in his life but there were a number of women in his life that helped him along he had a number of wet nurses, you know, uh, Thuweba, 
you know, uh, Um Ayman, he had a number, Halima, Saadia, these were all women who catered to him in the way that his biological mother would have catered to him. So having, being surrounded by all of these women at such a young age in his life, and he even named his youngest daughter, Fatima, after a woman that had such an impact on his life, who was Fatima bintu Esed, who was the wife of Abu Talib, Ali's mother. She was also had a hand in raising him, and he named his daughter Fatima after her, mm -hmm. and he gave her the nickname Um Abiha. She is her mother's fa he's she's her father's mother. Meaning Fatima acted towards the Prophet Sallallahu interacted with him the way that his mother would have. Meaning Fatima bin to Esed, he used to call her his mother. Mm -hmm. Um Amen, he used to refer to her as his mother. So there was a connection between him and these women. So it's almost a wonder, like, you know, had the Prophet Wasallam grown up in an environment where he had his biological mother, and he had, you know, a, 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 a more profound of uh, connection, this maternal love, would he have even gone into polygyny the way that he has? Can we say that his upbringing had no impact or no bearing on him going into polygyny later on in his life, I would say that it did have an, it mm -hmm. did have an impact on that. Absolutely. Have you heard, we'll get into, we're going to go to break, but have you heard of this uh, gentleman's kind of big news, Adam uh, Lyons? He's talking about Lyons, Lyons uh, from London. He's all over the, he's, he, we want to talk about the luckiest, he's, he's been coined the luckiest man alive. I don't right. know, we'll talk about him. Have you right, heard of him? Yeah, yeah I have. Okay, I we, have. we'll take a break and we'll be right back with this exciting episode. Don't go anywhere. God Almighty Allah says in the Quran, O oh, you who believe, fasting is prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those before you, that you may learn self-restraint and become more God conscious, mindful of your Creator. Thank you, my friends. Remember, caring is sharing, so like and share this video and support the Dean Show so we can continue educating and sharing the message of peace peace acquired by submission to the will of God, Islam, with the world. Assalamu alaikum. Have a blessed Ramadan. Peace be with you. Welcome back to the Dean Show. We're with my old friend, Sheikh Shadid Muhammad. And before we went to break, you're talking about alpha male. Mm -hmm. And it would, would, would Adam Lons, I for the people that I don't know, there was a lot of media. He's been on many of the popular talk shows. I've got to say, you just look like the cat that's got the cream sitting there with your two <laughs> lovely ladies. I think that's the trouble, Adam, isn't it? There's always that kind of notion of, oh, he's having his cake and eating it. Oh, he's happy, <laughs> lucky chap. <laughs> uh, explain to us why it's deeper than that for you. Yeah, I think, you know, I get that a lot. News articles, all because he has two girlfriends that he lives with and they share a king-size bed. The thruple share a king-size bed and take turns in it to have romantic date nights together. Right? <laughs> and it's just ironic that he's been coined the luckiest man, kind of society, not everybody, but it's kind of something that hasn't been shamed to look down upon. And he's probably, he's been propped up, like, you know, this is a good thing, you know right. what I mean, by right, a, right. A, a lot of people. Uh, it's not, now it's uh, on the other side, it just, kind of a double standard if a man goes and was to because these are girlfriends right and they're doing things that are inappropriate you know according to to god uh and if this man would have took them as his wives and maybe they had a kid size bed just for the two and he had separate houses and he took care of them individually right, right, right? right. he did the the the, the way that the, the legislative responsible the way. responsible way uh the responsible way is kind of sh looked down upon why is that I, well, I just think that that's just a, a microcosm of, of where our society is. I mean, you know, not to get political, but we have a president that tweets threats to other people. And I mean, this is socially acceptable. So I just think that, you know, this is a microcosm of where our society is and the type of um, the, the, the social standards that have been lowered and, and, and now have become the new norm. You know, and the Prophet Wasallam, you know, he prophesied that times like this would come. He called it Sanawat Khida'at, you know, years of 
deception where the believer the 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 person who's truthful will be considered untruthful and the person that's you know untruthful will be considered truthful and the person that's trustworthy will be considered untrustworthy and you know th so basically things that were normally acceptable will be replaced with a new norm and so today where um a man such as a muslim who's you know abiding by the religion of islam can marry more than one woman provide for them equally, you know, financially, emotionally, you know, religiously, provide for these women on an equal basis um, and be responsible with that and having children from them and, you know, and, and raising those children as his own. This is something that is frowned upon. And then you take the same in the same concept and just remove all of the religious rules and regulations and just say a man just takes two girlfriends and, you know, and he goes and he gets both of them pregnant at the same time and he's living with them in the same home. You know, no respect for the human boundaries of, you know, people needing their own space. The responsibility of, you know, years ago, a man having a child with a woman that he wasn't married to would have been considered illegitimate. And a crime, a crime, right. actually. Absolutely. It, it was a crime, right? Absolutely. It was a crime right here in American society. It was actually a crime. Um, and, you know, those children would have been considered illegitimate. And today, you know, we prop people up like this and we, you know, we sing their praises today. And it almost seems like anything that is not tied or connected to religion is acceptable. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how absurd, doesn't matter how weird or how socially uh, abnormal it is. As long as it's not connected to any religion, it's socially acceptable. Anytime something is connected to a religion based upon divine laws and rules and regulations is frowned upon. It's unacceptable. Yeah. Even in the in the community, you'll see where they talked about this. The 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 man is considered, you know, scumbag. The woman is like stupid for allowing this. Right. Right. Uh, this is kind of like opposite. But then here you go, Adam. He's like the luckiest man alive. People are like, right. he's our hero. Men are like, he's our hero. Right. Even, some women yeah. are even considering it now. E even in the even in, in the Islamic community, you know, part of the reason why polygyny is not able to, you know, take its its rightful place in our religion is because of Muslims, who are you know who you know have allowed the societal norms of of, of where we live to define to define what is acceptable even in our religion. So you have Muslim women who would think about or consider marrying into a plural marriage situation and you might she might be stigmatized or she might be frowned upon and looked at as stupid or you know less of less uh, uh, intelligent for doing so. You know, you have women that will say, well, you're smart, you're beautiful, you're young. Why would you, you know, marry into a situation like this where you have non-Muslims who now this growing trend of a man being with multiple women in a boyfriend girlfriend setting or you know in a in a context of being a boyfriend and girlfriend and they, and they're actually trying to make it work you know and it's it's almost you know hypocritical to some degree mm -hmm. and and it is a double standard why well, it seems like in another aspect people again are trying to tell women what to do i mean this is like a cons this is a mature woman this is actually her right. Right. People always look at it from one angle. This is like the man, but no, this is a blessing for women. Absolutely. I mean, Jane and I are not being mind controlled. We're not being no more we're like, saving. We are know? here of our own free will. Yeah. Don't. You don't need to rescue us. We're okay. If anyone needs saving, actually, it's, it's me. Probably Adam. <laughs> and now you're trying to impede on a woman's rights and trying to tell her again what to do and what she can't do. Right. Absolutely. And any any woman that is in polygyny, at least in American society, anyway, and there are tons of Muslim families that practice polygyny even here in America any woman that is in that situation is in that situation because she chose she chose to marry into a situation like that there's a quote that I, I bring at the at the beginning of my book did her religion force her to do that no did it, does Islam all. say look do, you have to do this not at all okay there's a quote that mentions in the beginning of my book by Kim George, and it says, Behind every happy couple lies two people who have fought hard to overcome all obstacles and interferences to be that way. Why? Because it's, it's because that's what they wanted. They chose to be that way. So when you find two people, two women or three women in a situation where they are married to one man, that is their choice. They chose to find happiness. They chose to find love 
in a non-conventional, a non-traditional relationship. Mm -hmm. They chose to find love that way. Why is it that we will make excuses for people who, you know, for same-sex relationships? We'll make every excuse in the world. They were born that way. You know, no one can judge them. No one can t determine where they find love. But then when we try to fo follow a divine law, divine law, and this is not just in Islam. Polygyny is just not allowed in Islam, but also in Christianity, offering, or, or, as well as in Judaism. These are divine laws that have allowed this practice for generations. And, you know, we would condemn that, but then we would make excuses for something that no divine law would, you know, would condone. Are people like in an uproar, politicians, are they like, you know, really going after uh, D-Ray? He's got a show I heard. Uh, you were telling me D-Ray Davis. I have the two live-in girlfriends? Yes, I do. Okay. And how do you make that work? They work with each other. They're comfortable. As long as they're comfortable, you make it work by paying the bills, man. Let's be real. Do you still have the two girlfriends? For the rest of my life. More than that, you just and they pissed all, off. And they live you with just you? pissed off all my other girlfriends by by saying it's just two. I will say this: like two at the top. Performed in Africa. I've been over there, but I haven't performed. You can't talk about side chicks. They got seven wives. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's a pretty popular show. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Are, are people? Is he getting? Is is? Are they trying to ban? I mean, are they trying to uh, come after him? Are people no, not protesting? It's or? become the new norm because it's not connected to any religion. So if, it's a hit show. Yes. So it means that means it's 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 acceptable. It's socially acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe that if he was to come out tomorrow and say that he's a Muslim and that he's going to marry both of these women and do it the Islamic way, they would shut the show off. He would be the worst, not the luckiest guy in the world. He would be the worst man in yeah. the world. So as long as they're your girlfriends, it's okay. So as long put, as they... Put them in the back, put them in the trunk, put them in a the U-Haul, as many as you want. Right. But as soon as uh, you you marry these women, it's an Absolutely. issue. Absolutely. I mean, you think about, I, I hate to go there, but I mean, you think about somebody like Hugh Hefner, mm. who has a Playboy mansion where he has all of these women living in this mansion, many of whom he sleeps with, never condemned for that. But a man who marries more than one woman, responsible, he has children with them. Those children bear his name. Those children will inherit from him. He's condemned. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the society that we live in. Do you, do you think people, uh, because a lot of times this might get associated with something evil. People have seen what's been projected on the media, so many of these cults, Mormon religion, you know, people having like all these underage girls um f no limit to them they're doing all sorts of scandalous things so now people attribute that a lot of times when people misuse and abuse religion and some of the beautiful things that have been sanctioned by the creator now people have a really bad taste in their mouth you think this might kind of have something to do with it yeah i think it has a lot to do with it people tend to say well if it's if it's if it's a institution if it's a relationship that is governed by religion then we tend to think that the woman was forced into that situation. The religion forces that upon or superimposes that on the woman. And we never stop to think that in Islam, nothing is superimposed on you. You have a choice in everything in this religion. This is the beauty of the religion. You know, Allah says in many verses in the Quran, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wishes to, you know, believe, then let him believe. And whoever wishes to disbelieve, then let him disbelieve. You know, uh, there are verses in the Quran where Allah says that, you know, That whoever finds guidance, finds guidance for the benefit of his own soul. And whoever chooses to find misguidance, then he does so to the detriment of his own soul. You have a choice in everything, in our religion. You have a choice in everything. But people usually associate religion with, you know, imposition. You know, this is imposed on you per the religion and so therefore you don't have a brain you know this is what things are said about muslim women they don't have a brain they don't think for themselves their husbands make all of their decisions for them you know not just with islam i'm sure christian women of the same caliber you know run into the same stigmas the same you know um you know this the the same you know same things but the fact of the matter is that the religion doesn't superimpose that. Any woman who is in a monogamous relationship is in a monogamous relationship because she chose to. 
uh, and you know, any woman that is married against her will in Islam, whether in monogamy and more so in polygyny, then the marriage is invalid. No forced marriage in Islam. There is no forced marriage. You can't marriage, force a woman to get right? married. Which means that a woman actually does have a brain. Yeah. A woman can actually choose for herself. As a matter of fact, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi he said, you know, that the woman who is a matron, the woman who has been married previously, she has more right to decide who she wants to marry than her own father. Why? Because a woman who has experienced marriage previously, she now knows because marriage is going to bring out things about yourself. You're going to learn a lot about yourself in this institution of marriage. And even once that marriage dissolves and you move on, you have learned so much more about yourself and you know, you're able to distinguish now your needs from your wants. Going into a marriage from the very beginning as a virgin, whether male or female, we conflate our needs with our wants. We don't know the difference between what we need and what we want. Hence the fact we make a lot of mistakes in the marriage. But once you leave that marriage, you exit that marriage, you have a clear, finite understanding of your needs and your wants. And therefore, a woman has more right to decide who she wants to marry than her wali, than her own guardian. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to take a break wonderful topic we started talking about love and then we're talking about uh polygyny we jumped into it uh can you separate the two we have so much more to talk about i want to ask you that how why does this have to come up if he loves me why does he have to you know why do i have to share is this is man Very program good. is man programmed like this uh, what's all this uh, about why does he have to even why does this have even have to be a discussion we'll be right back with more to answer these very important questions don't go anywhere let us follow in the footsteps of the greatest men who ever walked this earth the messengers that god almighty sent like abraham moses jesus and muhammad peace be upon them all who all called people to worship the creator alone and not his creation take a moment now and fulfill one of those qualities and that's of giving towards the dawah something all these great giants did and called people to do help us reach our yearly goal for ramadan help be part of sharing the truth support the deen show Back here on the Dean Show. So why do we, again, some people might say, why are you even talking? Is Ramadan? You know, why are you guys talking about this? We got serious issues going on. And uh, not only ha are you the author of the book, what's the book the called? The, the Revolution, Revolution of, the of Revolution Love. The Revolution of Love. So we start talking about love. And now we're talking about this uh, extending the, the family, right? right? Can you separate the and two? And that's a good word that you use, extending the family. Yeah, so someone says, why are you guys even discussing this? If, if he loves me, then he wouldn't be even bringing this up. Why, why, why the issue now? Well, some goes back to something that you said before we went to the break, and that is, uh, is man wired genetically to be with just one woman? Or is this something that, you know, is just part of his biological makeup that he has to be with more than one woman? Um, there was a study called um, the, the Coolidge Effect, and this is actually chapter one in my book, The Coolidge Effect. And this is a phenomenon where uh, researchers found that uh, when a man is with one woman for a substantial amount of time, uh, he goes through what is called a post-ejaculatory refractory period, which, is, which means basically that he gets tired of being with the same woman for a substantial amount of time. But when a new woman is introduced into the relationship, then it kind of rekindles. He wakes up again? He wakes up again, absolutely. And they did the study with mice. They did it with other animals. And this, this is, is something that this was This is documented. science now. This, this is science. Is. So basically it's saying that men are not genetically wired to be with one woman for the duration of his life. I mean, case closed. So why, how, why are you going to beat up on the man now? <laughs> so... Uh, that's not to say that some men are not content with one woman, and they are. Some men are, but those men that are content with one woman, with one woman, um, those men are the exception to the rule, not the rule. Evidenced by the the many documented, well documented, as well as those ha that have not been documented instances of men that are having extramarital relationships with women that they're not married to. 
you know, um, polygyny was actually the, the standard of marriage before the dawn of the Roman Catholic Church, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Historically, anthropologists have studied, you know, ancient societies and have found that polygyny was the actual practice of marriage, that a man, and of course, there was no limit because it wasn't actually a divine law. This was just something that, and I mean, this is something documented even with many of the prophets. Prophet Suleiman had more than one wife. Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam. We, we have, you know, um, practices, celebratory practices in our religion that commemorates, you know, one of Ibrahim's wives and another one that commemorates another wife. You know, he yeah. had one wife, Hajar, that he left in, in Mecca with his son Ismail, and he had another wife, Sarah, that he left in Palestine. But the you Bible, know. does the Bible talk about him having three wives? I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure how many wives, but there are well documented, you know, instances in the Bible where men had more than Prophet David, Prophet Dawood. Yeah, these are, these are, so the greatest men to walk the earth. They had big families. Absolutely, they had they had big families. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's a uh, incident in, incident where Prophet uh, Suleiman, who had 99 wives, and he said in a hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu said that he said, "I'm going to go to all of my wives in one night, and each one of them is going to deliver a male child that will fight in the cause of Allah." But he didn't say Inshallah. So which means if God wills, right? And so he went to all of his wives and none of them gave birth to a child except one and the child came out, you know, deformed. It was only half of a child, mm -hmm. you know. And the point that I'm making is that we see all of these stories, documented, you know, stories, divine stories that are, you know, documenting, you know, these men, these great men that we look up to, that we praise, that we try to emulate, you know, and, and incorporate their behaviors in our day-to-day -day characters. And yet, when we try to emulate that particular aspect of their lives, then it's frowned upon, it's shunned. And so to answer your question, why are we actually having this discussion? Why, if a man loves a woman, then why does he need another woman? Can a man love more than one woman? Because when you say, if he loves her, why does he need another woman? So basically, you're, you're saying that his love should be restricted to her. If he loves her, then he should not want another woman. So then basically, here we go again, trying to put love in a box. Can a man love more than one woman? Absolutely. But he cannot love them equally the same. We don't love our children equally the same. Mm -hmm. There's no human being that can say that you have 10 children, you love each and every one of your children the exact same way. You don't. There's always that one child that your heart, you know, just inclines towards, you know, for whatever reason. You know, you always have this one child that has a special need that maybe the other children don't have, or another child that is very vulnerable and naive, and you have to cater to that child more than the other. Does that mean that there's a baseline love that you have for all of your children? Yes, there's a baseline love that you have for all of your children, but is there a particular child that your heart just, you know, inclines towards? Absolutely, absolutely. We all say if we grew up in big families, I don't know about you, I, I grew up in a, in a you know, I have three sisters and um, we always say that this particular child is my mom's favorite. You're the favorite. This is the argument amongst siblings. Who is the favorite, right? This was the argument amongst Prophet Yusuf, right? What did the brothers of Prophet Yusuf say? That, you know, that Yusuf is, you know, is more beloved to Prophet Yaqub than we are. And we are a bigger group because Prophet Yaqub himself had more than one wife. Right? So Yusuf and Benjamin was from one wife and the other brothers were from another wife. And so the confusion or the, the, the disgruntlement was because the group, the larger group of brothers, thought that Prophet Yaqub loved uh, Yusuf and Benjamin more than he loved them. Mm -hmm. So this happens even amongst siblings, you know, that who's the most favorite. So this shows that the parents, and no matter how much you as a parent try to love your children equally, children, they pick up on these things. Just as if you have multiple wives, they're going to pick up on that as well. Mm -hmm. They're going to see that, you know, this particular wife, you let her get away with certain things. And this particular wife, you, you know, cater to her in a certain way. And that's just human. That's just who we are as human beings. Mm -hmm. But can a man love more than one woman? Yes. Can he love them equally the same? No. Mm -hmm. Love should be, as I've heard, uh, multiplied, not divided. Multiplied, not divided. Have you heard that one? <laughs> no. No? I have now. Yeah. <laughs> I want to make a, a 
comparison here to kind of trends changing and where do we want to be? And maybe you can see where I'm going with and kind of correlate this to our discussion. You know, when you look at some one of the sunnas that we have, and again, this goes back to the great men. They all used to have the beard, right? Right. And if you even look at now science today, it's showing that it, it helps to prevent cancer with the UV rays coming in. So wow. I, I just get amazed with the deep. <laughs> we don't obviously do it because of that, but even in these things, there's great wisdom from right. the divine, right? So this article talks about, and it was a legit study, we'll have it up, where it, it, it's uh, cancer preventing, for preventing the, the rays coming and hitting your the UV rays to your skin. Also, many of the pollens and everything is trapped here for, for help prevent asthma. Wow. And the list goes on. But not that. You have so many athletes, so so many. Have you noticed everyone has a beard nowadays? Not yeah. everyone, but a growing number of people. It's become like it's the become new trend, trend right? right? But we were doing it before it was trendy, right. right? But now on the other side, you have a lot of you know people who, you know, because of the culture, right? Before, years back, people were looking down upon you because you had a beard. You follow right. me? But now because it's fashionable, people are like growing acceptable. But some people are just staying still behind. Right. You follow me? But now equating that to, to here, we've gave some examples with uh, Derave Davis. Many people might not know his name. I didn't. You mentioned him. Mary J. Bl uh, Blige. But uh, Adam Lyons, who's really now popular. He's like the, the coolest man. Would you consider him an alpha male? Um, I, I don't know. I can't say because a man has more than one woman. Uh, sometimes it can be an overcompensation yeah. for. But, but people, people <laughs> you know are I mean? considering him an alpha male, the ma average yeah. people, right? Yeah. So you see where I'm going with this yeah. now? Do you see how you know trends are dictating certain things? What's yes. in, what's out? But right. where should we be as Muslims now? Where should we? What's what is our guiding force, shining light, with all the confusion, right, to dictate to us our blueprint? Make right. it easy. We have our blueprint. Our, our blueprint has already been laid out for us. And I mean, not all the, not only has it been laid out for us in terms of the Quran being here and ex explained in his various different explanations, but we also have it, you know, um, actually walked out. We've seen the Prophet Sallallahu live the Quran in his life, even though times were changing. You know, he lived. Can we say that Prophet Muhammad in the 23 years that he was a prophet, that times didn't change? Times changed. And even though with the change of time, we still found him holding fast to the values. And I mean, even his companions afterwards, you know, they held on. Times were changing and they held on to those values. And, you know, as I say all the time, your values will dictate your trajectory. Where you're going in life, your values will dictate that. You know, uh, there's a beautiful story in Sahil Bukhari where, um, um, uh, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, who was the leader of the Muslims during that time, um, this was way after, well after the death of the Prophet wasallam, and some of the Sahaba were still alive. One in particular, Abu Sa'il al-Khudri, main companion of the Prophet wasallam, very knowledgeable. So it was the day of the Eid, and we know that on the day of the Eid, the 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 salah is first and the khutbah is second you know and this is juxtaposed to jumuah where the khutbah is second and the the i mean the khutbah is first and the the salah is second so as they were coming out to the musalla area um abdul malik ibn marwan began to walk towards the mimbar instead of the musalla and so abu sa'id al-khudri began to walk on the side of him and grabbed him by his hand and he whispered in his ear and he said, you know, what you are getting ready to do, we never knew that during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu meaning to give the khutbah first. We never did that during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu And so Abdul Malik ibn Marwan reached over to Abu Sayyid al-Khudri's ear and he said, well, the thing that you guys used to do is no longer a factor, meaning people don't sit and listen to the khutbah anymore. So we pray the Eid Salat. When I stand up to give the khutbah, everybody walks away. No one sits. So this shows you that times were changing. And though, although some people try to change with the time by forsaking some of the values and principles of the religion, there are those of us who should hold fast to the values and principles of the religion, regardless of what's going on around you. But we should still know how to navigate change. And our religion does teach us how to navigate changing times. The Prophet Sallallahu prophesied that things were going to change drastically towards the last days. And I, and I do believe that we are living a lot of that now. And he said in, in many instances, hold on to my sunnah. He didn't say change with everybody else. 
He said, hold on to my sunnah. Alaykum bis sunnati wa sunnati khulafa al-rashideen al-mahdiyeen abdu alayha bin nawajid. He said, hold fast to my sunnah, my practices, and the practices of the rightly guided khalifas or khulafa, and bite onto it with your molar teeth. Which means that there should be some stability. Stability, our values dictate our trajectory. You know, so while we do see things changing and the trends changing, you know, and it's sometimes as Muslims, I think that we do look hypocritical sometimes because we will not, the, and I'm talking about the mainstream body of the Muslims. You have those that will always stick close to the Sunnah. You're always going to have a group, the Prophet prophesies that there will always be a group that will hold fast to the Sunnah. But then the vast majority, we're trendsetter, you know, we're trend followers, right? At back kulinaik, as Abdullah bin Mas'ud he said, La tukunu ima. Don't be followers. That if everybody else does good, you decide to do good, and if everybody does evil, then you decide to do evil. He said, Allah you waktinu ahadukum nafsahu and either kafar on nas and la yakfur. That you should condition yourself that if everyone in the world decided to disbelieve, that you are not going to disbelieve. Meaning there are certain values that we hold on to despite the changes that are going around, uh, you know, happening around us. I'll give you an example. Um, the scarf, you know, the sometimes we wear it on our heads as a gutra, and then it became like trendy to wear it around the neck, the scarf, right? Mm -hmm. When Muslims were wearing that on their heads here in America, they would be looked at as extreme. That you're not in Saudi Arabia, you're not in anywhere else in the Muslim world, why are you wearing that on your head? But then when singers like Chris Brown started to wear the scarf around their neck and, you know, it became trendy, mm -hmm. then you started to see the Muslims wearing it. Now it's cool. Now it's cool. Beards. The vast majority of the Muslim community, you know, did not have beards. You know, in the early 90s, in the late 90s, in the early 2000s, the beard was not a popular thing. But there was a group of Muslims that did don beards. They wore beards. And then when it became popular amongst athletes, you know, you have, you know, some of the basketball players, you know, some of the rappers, you know, they grow beards now and it became trendy. Now the Muslim, you see, you go to the young, you know, Muslim community, the mainstream Muslim community, you see a lot of the younger guys now who would have never before had a beard because we've accepted this, you know, Western, you know, ideology of being clean shaven, you know, mm -hmm. and, and wearing a suit and tie, right? And so it, it becomes, you know, we're followers of trends. We're not creators of trends, mm -hmm. you know, and the hijab, you know, now that coverall and, you know, other places, Essence they, in their magazines, now they're incorporating the Islamic hijab, right? So now you can open a lot of these, you know, female magazines and you will see women in there. Gap, Gap has a commercial on TV where now a woman in hijab is now, you know, modeling their clothes. And so now younger Muslim women are feel comfortable, feel more comfortable wearing the hijab when, you know, whether it's socially accepted or not, we still have an obligation to stick to our values and our principles. Absolutely. Know? What are some of the favorite chapters in your book? Um, I think the chapter, um, Can a Man Love More Than One Woman? I mm -hmm. think that that's very, you know, very interesting. You know, even myself, as, I'm, as I was writing the, you know, book and, you know, documenting, you know, some of my thoughts, um, about the chapter, um, you know, it just opened up a whole, you know, can of worms as it relates to the concept of love. I'm a convert to Islam, so much of what I saw coming into the religion, I didn't see, you know, um, the marriages, Islamic marriages, function the way that I saw in Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that Christian marriages are more valid than Islamic marriages. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that Islamic marriages tend to function on a very quid pro quo, you know, type of philosophy you know as long as you're giving me my rights i'll give you your rights you know and i you know grew up in a home where i've seen my parents you know um you know maybe not necessarily get along but divorce was never on the table the divorce was never you know it's just like almost like we have that and and it, we abuse it you know it's almost like adam in the tree if allah had not told adam don't eat from this tree is it a wonder whether adam would have even wanted to eat from the tree but it's like when you tell someone, don't do something, we desire what we can't have. So when Allah says, don't pronounce divorce, or the religion says divorce is not the most desirable thing, it's like that's the thing that we desire the most. Mm -hmm. You know, so you'll find Islam, Muslim marriages, many Muslim marriages are just, you know, they're on airplane mode. They just coast and husband and wife function as roommates. 
You don't really see love. You don't really see compassion. You don't really see, and I'm a marriage counselor, so I counsel a lot of couples, and I can tell you a lot of the couples that come through my door, um, sometimes I'm baffled, and I'm saying to myself, how can two people who live together in a relationship governed by a religion that puts love at the helm of the relationship, how could you function with each other like this? I, I'm, I'm amazed. Love is, is the cornerstone of our religion. Aside from marriage, the Prophet said, None of you truly believes until you love, you love for your brother what you love for yourself. One of Allah's names is Al Wadud, the loving. Love is at the helm of our religion. So how is it that two people who share a relationship together, governed by a religion that puts love at the forefront of everything that we do, how, how could they do the things that they do to one another? You, 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 you follow me? Yes. I, I just don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So it's either we don't understand love, or we do, but we just don't have a regard for it. Mm -hmm. We don't care for it. You know, and that's another trend that is going on in, in, in our society where relationships are just business deals. You know, you, you pay for my rent, you take care of me, and then I'll take care of you sexually. I'll, you know, make your food. I'll do whatever I need to do on my part. But I'm not doing it out of love. I'm doing it because you're doing for me what I need you to do for me. It's a quid pro quo philosophy. And that's not love. The Prophet Sallallahu he was standing with one of his companions and a, a man walked by and a man said to him, you know, a messenger of Allah, I love that guy. And the Prophet said, well, did you go tell him? He said, no. He said, go tell him. Why did he tell him to go tell him? Because when you tell someone I love you, it changes everything. It changes the way that they feel about themselves. Some people don't even love themselves. Some people don't even know that it's okay to love themselves. Some people seek validation for, them, for their own selves by loving other people. They out in the service of other people looking for self-validation. People spend their lives as passengers in a vehicle to their own self-awareness. You're a passenger in your own journey to self-awareness. Mm -hmm. You don't even know. You're, you're asking other people permission to love yourself, you know. And so telling someone that you love them and sincerely meaning it, it forces the person to see you differently and it forces them to see themselves differently. Some people don't love themselves. You know, the prophet was with one of his companions, you know, um, and this guy was a slave and he was freed. And, you know, much like the, narr the, the narrative of many of the companions who came out of slavery and things like that. And he was in the marketplace selling his stuff. And the Prophet walked behind him, Zahir ibn Haram. He walked behind him and he grabbed him, joking with him. And so, you know, he tried to turn and see who it was. And when he realized it was the Prophet, he relaxed. And the Prophet said jokingly, Men yashtari minni hadhal abd, who will buy this slave from me? And he was joking. And the servant, he's uh, and the Zahir, he said, you know, if you are referring to me, O Messenger of Allah, you will find me worthless. You will find me worthless goods. No one would buy me. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Bal anta indallahi ghalin. He said, no, to Allah, you are priceless. You're priceless to Allah. You in society may see you as worthless, but in the sight of Allah, you are priceless. Boost of confidence now. Boost of confidence. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, this is how some people see themselves. They see themselves as being worthless, as being nothing. And this could be based upon their upbringing, based upon, you know, society has just kind of dealt them a raw deal. You know, they had a bad hand. They was dealt a bad hand for whatever reason. But, you know, love helps to change that perception. So, you know, it's, it's important that we make sure that our marriages are founded on love and not founded on superficial, you know, um, you know, endeavors like saving myself from the hellfire. Yeah. Like we hear that often in the Islamic community. I want to get married to save myself from the hellfire. Okay, but the person that you are marrying might be marrying for a reason other than that. They might be marrying because they actually want to be in love. They've never been in love before. They want to be in a relationship where they want to have someone cater to their emotional needs. They want to be in a relationship where they have someone cater to see them as a human being, to care for them the way that they've always wanted to be cared for. While your only concern is, I'm married now, I don't have to worry about committing fornication, right, or adultery.
right? So it's, it's kind of objectification, that we objectify the institution of marriage. And this is one of the things that I talk about, you know, in uh, my book, The Revolution of Love, um, you know, and this, and this is probably the most important chapter to me. And then I have a chapter at the end of the book called The Do's and Don'ts of Polygyny. You know, uh, I could have put more in there, but I put a few in there, do's and don'ts of polygyny, basically like a, a blueprint. You know, a lot of us as men, this is the first time that we've ever been in any situation remotely close to, you know, polygyny. You know, yeah, probably those of us who are converts to Islam or those of us who, you know, were not practicing Islam, you know, prior to our conversion or prior to our submission to Islam, we may have had multiple girlfriends and maybe have juggled a few women here and there. But being married to multiple women is nowhere near in comparison to juggling multi because there there's no really no responsibility. There's no accountability. There's no one to hold you accountable. You can basically do you. There's no responsibility, but in, in Islam, in polygyny, there's responsibility and there is accountability if that responsibility is not fulfilled. The Prophet Sallallahu said that any man who has more than one wife, that he inclines towards one of them more than the other, that he will come on the day of judgment and one of his sides will be leaning. He will be, it will be a deformity. A deformity in front of the world, in front of everyone standing there waiting to be judged. And you will stand there with this deformity in front of everyone and everyone will know why you are deformed. And that is because you incline towards one wife more than the other. And there are other divine consequences in this life as well as in the hereafter for those, you know, who embark on this journey of polygyny. So, you know, it's there is responsibility and with responsibility there is accountability. Before we come to to an end, uh, is there any uh, chapter helping people to achieve more of a optimal level of emotional stability? You know, this can be there's could be a lot of emotions being stirred up. Is there anything that deals with emotional stability, helping someone achieve the maximum in this, or yes. tips and tricks? And absolutely, uh, in the do in the chapter of the do's and don'ts, that you know, just giving some pointers. Don't do this. Do do this. Um, there's also another chapter in there that I have is called the first wife syndrome and then another chapter, the second wife syndrome. And there's, I think there's a first wife syndrome yes. and a second wife syndrome. Yes. The first wife syndrome is basically what the first wife goes through when the man actually marries mm -hmm. another woman. There's a there's a there's a plethora of emotions and, you know, actions and behaviors that a woman experiences when and the longer she's married to her husband, the more critical those behaviors become, you know, because she's invested in anyone who has invested in anything. I mean, think about businessmen who invest in a business, right? Thriving business, lucrative business. And then, the, you know, they may have invested that business in the stock market or whatever, and then it crashes and they lose their business. Some of those men commit suicide because they've lost their business. They've lost everything. Why? Because investment. When you invest in something, emotional investment. This is someone who has been working at this job for 30 years. That is not a job. That is his life. Understand that. So when you fire a guy after 30 years on the job, nine times out of 10, he's going to do something damaging to himself or to you. He might try to kill you or he might go jump off of a bridge and kill himself because there was this was not just a job. This has become his life. So when a woman is married to a man for 10 years, 15 years, and then out of nowhere, he decides to go and marry another woman, you know, there's a well-documented situation that happened, you know, in the early 2000s where a woman in Philadelphia actually killed her husband. She murdered her husband for marrying another woman. He married a woman, a Moroccan sister, and she found him laying in the bed and she took a gun and she shot him in the head, you know? And, you know, the point that I'm making is that, you know, when there's personal investment, when there's emotional investment in something, when you try to separate that from the person, that does not go easy. So a lot of times brothers are, are, you know, you know, are like, well, just get over. It. It's just jealousy. No, it's beyond jealousy. Trust me. It is beyond jealousy. This woman has invested her entire life in you and what you guys have built. 
that is not you know you have to be emotionally savvy you have to be you know very smart very wise and how you introduce it how you go about it and even if it's the most perfect the most picture perfect situation it's still not going to diminish the emotion the jealousy the insecurity and everything that comes about as a result of your decision and sometimes women never recover from that i know women i've counseled women who were taking medication because their husbands have taken other wives. So, you know, and these were provided not some of the best situations that, that were done in the most upright manner. And But what I am saying is that even if you take the most picture perfect situation and you do it the right way, it still does not mean that the woman is not entitled to her emotions and her feelings and her, you know, insecurities and, you know, all of those things that are going to come about. You know, and this is why the Prophet Sallallahu intervened when Ali wanted to take a second wife. Ali was married to the Prophet's youngest daughter, Fatima. Fatima, uh, at the time when she married Ali, her mother was deceased, Khadija was deceased, and all of her older sisters were, were deceased. Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kuthum, they were all deceased. So Fatima was basically the baby girl, and on top of being the youngest, she had no other female support. She had no support system. And so Ali wanted to marry the daughter of Abu Jahl, who became Muslim. She converted to Islam, Jamila, and he wanted to marry her as a second wife. And the Prophet said no. He went to Ali and he said, I am not making something haram that Allah made halal. And this is very important for people to understand. He's not challenging the polygyny. What he's doing is he's removing his daughter from that situation. He said, I'm not making something haram that Allah made halal. He said, but the daughter of Muhammad will not be united in a marriage with the daughter of the enemy of Muhammad. And that was the daughter of Abu Jahl. You know, how would that look in the community for the Prophet to allow, you know, Ali, his, who's married to his daughter, to marry another woman who her father was the, you know, the Fir'aun of our Ummah. You know, and you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, it complicates it even more. Not only that, as the scholars explain, the reason why the Prophet intervened was because Fatima didn't have a support system. The Prophet and all of his wives and his family and everything that his responsibilities, he would not have been able to be there for her emotionally the way that she would need someone. And, and women in those situations, they need maternal comfort. They need a mother. They need women to comfort them through those emotions because they share those emotions. A man, we don't understand what they are going through. So the Prophet Sallallahu he intervened and he told Ali no. And Ali, you know, against the situation he later on you know before fatima died he later on married into polygyny and and actually the situation worked out best because fatima was very sick and the other wife actually assisted in that process but at that moment it was it wasn't a good time you know so what i'm saying is that this chapter you know first wife syndrome just kind of gives us a more in-depth look into what our women are going through when we decide to go into this. Mm -hmm. And then there's a second wife syndrome, and that is the woman that is coming in, the new woman coming in, and all of the pressures that are put on her from both her family, from society, and even marrying into a family, an already made family. Just think about a woman who maybe she's never been married before, and then she's marrying into a polygynous situation, an already made family. This guy has this this woman, this wife, they have maybe two or three children and she's marrying into this situation. It can be daunting. It can be very, you know, scary, you know. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm highlighting, you know, some of the pressures, uh, some of the challenges that women are, who are second wives come in. Sometimes they come into a situation and they feel like they have to pity the first wife and they have to, you know, conform to her every command just to try to make her feel more comfortable. I mean, think about a woman marrying into an already made family. Sometimes she comes in feeling like a home wrecker mm -hmm. because that's the stigma. The community sees her as a home wrecker. Like you're marrying into this guy's family and you're going to destroy his family. You're a home wrecker. Yeah. You know, but you have over here, we, as we talked about earlier, the guy, Adam, who had two wives, right. he's not married to him. It's his girlfriend. And they do a lot of things that's not sanctioned by the creator. Right. And if, if Adam would, he would, uh, uh, marry them, right? Maybe accept Islam, right? Do right. it, do it right. Right. It'll be a different story. It'll be great, um, and he can get rewarded for that. Right. But my point is that in part of the interview, it talks about him actually getting jealous how them two are actually getting along, and getting along, and helping right. each other. Right. That's ironic, kind of. Right. right. Over here, you got them like supporting, helping, and right. he's getting jealous of that. Right. But over here, 
we don't have that we sometimes. don't we don't have that you know and that that has always puzzled me why do muslim women struggle so much with something that is already a part of our our religion and then you have non-muslims who this is a new phenomenon for them you know to actually come to the forefront of society and and learn to accept that and stand in that and be accepting of that this is a very new phenomenon for them and they seem like they they're totally okay with it and they seem like they fare very well with it very maturely um i think uh, I, one of the theories that i have about that is that with non-muslims their relationships are a lot different they pretty much get to know each other as they go along with muslims it's like you know i'm meeting with her her father her mother it's very formal you know and then we get married and then we kind of start our journey to learning one another mm -hmm. whereas with non-muslims they're kind of taking that journey simultaneously so you know they're learning one another they're being intimate with one another as they move along in their relationship whereas muslims we don't have that luxury yeah. you know we don't have that luxury so where could people get the book uh revolution can, of love the revolution of love a man's perspective on loving multiple women in a non-traditional marriage i actually have a gift for you that's for you thank you very much thank you very much uh and revolution you can, of love you can purchase the book uh from my website www.roda r-a-w-d-a-h.info right um you can go to the website uh, you can you know purchase the book from paypal there um, the book is also on Amazon as mm -hmm. well, uh, and you can purchase the book on Amazon as well. Revolution of Love, get your copy. Thank you very much. And any advice for the brothers and sisters out there in the closing uh, few last minute we have, uh, at last uh, Ramadan advice, anything that you want to give a shout out? Um, I would just say to be generous in Ramadan. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha said that, you know, the Prophet was very generous, was a very generous person, but the peak of his generosity was in the month of Ramadan, when Jibreel would meet with him every night in Ramadan and review the Quran. And the Prophet's generosity wasn't just restricted to being generous with money. Usually when we hear be generous, we're, we're thinking in terms of money, but the Prophet's generosity it was all encompassing of every single aspect of his life. He was generous with his, com you know, with his compliments. He didn't have a problem complimenting people. You know, he saw, you know, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud climbing in a tree and the Sahaba were laughing at his little legs. And the Prophet said, are you laughing at his legs? He said, I swear by Allah, his two little legs will weigh more on the scales on the day of judgment in front of Allah than the mountain of Uhud. You know, he didn't have a problem. Very, you know, learn how to be generous with your compliments. Learn how to compliment people. Compliment yourself. You know, tell yourself it's okay to tell yourself you look nice. It's okay to tell yourself you're handsome. It's okay to tell yourself you're beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. Be generous with your compliments. He was generous with his time, right? With his time. Sometimes we, you know, I don't really have time. Sometimes we function through text messages, which kind of takes the emotion out. Hence the fact we have emojis, which is the substitute for human emotion so we're using pictures now to substitute for human emotion and it's not fair because human interaction requires human emotion so be generous with your time you know don't send a text pick up a phone and call the person hey you know i was thinking about you you know how are you doing you know just to hear the person's voice and that human interaction this is something that we're moving totally away from totally yeah right so so be generous with your time you know the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know one of the women came and said oh messenger of allah you 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 know the men take up all of your time set aside a day for us just the women in the community to teach us and the prophet agreed to that and he would teach the women just the women on a day so be generous with your time, be generous with your compliments, be generous with your money, be generous with your relationship with Allah. That if you believe you have a good relationship with Allah, then use that relationship to help other people get to the point where you believe you are. Don't use that as a, as a means of looking down on people. You say, well, you know, I'm here religiously and you're not. No, that you having that position is a privilege. So you should use that to help bring other people up to the level that you believe you are. The Prophet used his position with Allah to bring people up, right? We say level up, to bring them up to another level. And examples, you know, one of his companions, Rabia ibn Ka'b al-Aslami, you know, he said to Rabia one time, ask me for whatever you want and I'll give it to you. And Rabia said, well, you know, he kind of caught him off guard with the question. So he said, well, let me think about it for a little bit and then I'll get back to you. 
And so he said, I thought to myself, you know, this dunya, the life of this world is transitory. It's, it's, it's quick passing. It makes no sense to ask him to ask Allah for something from this world. And, you know, my provision is going to come to me regardless. So he said, why not ask him for something from the hereafter? So when he met the Prophet again, the Prophet asked him, Rabia, Selni, or Atik. He said, Ask me and I'll give you what you want. He said, You know, you are aware of my position with Allah. Ask me for what you want and I'll give it to you. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, I ask you for your murafaqah. All I want is your companionship in Jannah. And the Prophet said, That's all you want? He said, Who are that, Ya Rasul? That's all I want. I just want to be your companion in Jannah. You know, and the Prophet, you know, supplicated on his behalf. So to use your position with Allah, if you believe that you have a good relationship with Allah, then use your relationship with Allah to help others. Not to look down on them, not to frown on them, not to make yourself look like you're better than them. You know, so this is what I would say. Be generous in the month of Ramadan and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Sheikh Shadid Muhammad, thank you very much again. My pleasure. My it's a pleasure, pleasure seeing you again. Inshallah, we'll have you back in the future. Inshallah. Jazakallah. Thank you so much.